There's also a special person here I'd like to welcome and call out. Um, her name is Allison Steele. Um, um, I don't know, she's looking like she might actually stand up. <laughs> she's moving. <laughs> Hi, Hi Allison. So, um, Allison is a professional um, uh, publicist and marketer and information officer and event planner person. Um, and she is um, formerly working with Middleway Health Foundation and Middleway Health and Lions Road Drama Center. Our activities are complex now and they need to be um, coordinated. And she's able to do that. Uh, and it's also consistent with my desire to um, bring the Dharma out into the community more and more and bring the community uh, here. So one of the main uh, things that we're doing uh, regularly along that line is called expressions that um, my friend Clement and I cooked up. And I think next month will be the eighth. So uh, no, I, just, <laughs> I just love it, so I could go on. But, uh, what, what we're doing here today and um, Tenzin Chucky's visit is part of reaching out into the community and uh, emphasizing the commonality of our experience and bringing um, what uh, some teachers have called, uh, and I call secular Dharma, right? Well, uh, secular means of the times, literally from the Latin. So we, we have the, uh, um, Sacred Dharma, that sacred Dharma is meant to be like timeless, and we've inherited many of the wonderful timeless archetypal uh, visions and the archetypal uh, rituals from India and Tibet. And for anybody who's visited uh, the East Asia, particularly India, they love rituals. <laughs> uh, and I do too, but uh, sometimes the, the basic message gets lost. And, and some of the ritual activity. And uh, we're just here to tell the truth as much as, as best we can. So uh, uh, I'm delighted uh, to see people. Some people will be staying um, afterwards for the rest of the program. And I um, formally like to go on record of uh, inviting Tetsun to come back. And uh, I'm gonna pass the mic over because we, we have, we've already cooked up this idea that I'm excited about. That's the one where we get people to talk to each other. <laughs> can you say something about that before we start talking? About, about how we're going to do it? Well, or yeah, like we're going to do it. Yeah, like we're our, do the it. little event thing we're cooking up. Oh, that, yeah, that thing. thing. Yeah, yeah, that thing. Yeah. Oh, the thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm tense and choking. <clears throat> really happy to be here. Some of you I've been with in a process all weekend so far, leading you through all the hard emotional stuff. You still stuck with me. Thank you for that. So I was telling Lama and some people yesterday about an uh, uh, event that I was helped coordinate last weekend that took place in Santa Cruz. And it sort of really relates to me, to the theme of this weekend class, all about empathy and compassion and connection, because I think we can all really recognize that we're in a deeply polarized world right now. I mean, especially nation and sometimes communities and sometimes families. There isn't a lot of connection happening. I'm thinking of, you know, the political situation, which has been completely paralyzed until like last week, apparently, when people finally started talking to each other, like what a concept and how things move. And so some friends and I were inspired by an idea that started in Europe during the Syrian refugee crisis called the Human Library. And so this venture to bring Syrian refugees to have conversations with the people in, started in Denmark, actually, and then spread to other Northern European countries because there was a lot of you know, misunderstanding stereotypes, like outright prejudice and discrimination against the Syrian refugees. And so they had this idea and they called it the human library that you can 
the reader can check out a book, the book being a person, for a loan period of 30 minutes for a conversation. And they and the whole premise is you talk to someone and connect with their humanity for 30 minutes, and you can no longer hold the same prejudices, stereotypes, and you know, the same fixed view because you connected to their humanity. And so we got really excited about this idea and we're like, let's put on a show. And so we partnered, a group of us partnered with was a partnership between the Conflict Resolution Center of Santa Cruz County that mostly does community mediation and trains people in conflict management skills. And then we asked the local Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History, if they could, who does a lot of community events, and they had the perfect venue. And so last weekend, we put on this event, and it was one afternoon, crazy successful. We had 12 different identities. So we asked people to represent an identity. We had people who were unhoused. We had a Black Lives Matter activist. We had a transgender man, a transgender woman, a non-binary person, a local indigenous person from the local tribal band. And then we had a Republican. We had an evangelical Christian. We had a police officer and we had a Muslim, what else? An Asian American uh, refugee. So we tried to pick identities that we felt like were, you wouldn't necessarily in Santa Cruz, like run into a Muslim or maybe a Republican. They're there, deeply hidden phenomena in Santa Cruz because it's so progressive. And it was really interesting because some of the people who volunteered to represent their identity, like the Republican actually canceled, we organized her and then Roe versus Wade was overturned and she backed out because they were getting death threats. And then she came back and she said, this is more important than ever to just sit down. And so for some, because Santa Cruz is a lot of you probably know is, swings far to the left. So we thought it was important to get these right, you know, people on the right. And everyone had the most amazing transformative experiences. All the dialogues were booked for the whole four hours. We had no idea, are two people going to show up or 200? It was much more like 200. And people seem to have such a thirst for this and connection and both the participants and the dialogue partners. Like I remember at the end, the Republican and the trans woman who just came out as trans like two years before, and she's in her 50s and transitioned and stayed married to her wife of 25 years after her transition. She was really nervous. The Republican was really nervous. The end, they came up just luminous. They couldn't stop hugging me. Like that was just amazing. So I told Lama Jumpa and he said, let's do it here in Sacramento. Because this is what we need to heal, you know, and it's healing for both parties like that. I wasn't expecting that. I was like, oh, these brave people representing their identities, being literally like sitting ducks, talking to total strangers, we had all kinds of safeguards in place to make it safe for them. And we had people watching out for them. And But it was healing for them. One, one man who was a participant, and he talked to about six different people. And he wrote me an email afterwards, and he was just raving about it. And his last sentence was, five stars. I'm forever changed. And I was just like, dude. So, so we're cooking up an idea, aren't we? <laughs> what do you think, Allie? Can, can we do it? It sounds great, doesn't it? Yeah. This is, this is good. Yeah. <laughs> I like connecting the dots. Yeah. In the moment. Yeah. And we've done all the hard work to figure out how it happens. Like we just started from scratch. And so I'm happy to share all the logistical as one of my friends who was part of it said, it was like the logistical Olympics to kind of coordinate the thing and figure out, we had 47 volunteers running the event. We had also interactive art. We had, we made this like loom with strips of cloth. And then we had strips of cloth that people could write their identities in Sharpie and weave it in. And we called it weaving the social fabric. People love that. We had another thing of, um, 
identity stickers of invisible or hidden identities that affect your life, but nobody could tell by looking at you. And things like left-handed, immigrant, you know, oldest child, military brat. People were like, picked like 20 and they had their entire shirts covered. And then they could talk about these ways that they were, their lives were impacted by things that were invisible. So yeah, we did a lot of, a lot of cool stuff like that. And the whole idea, and it really, if we don't start talking to each other, we're, we're doomed. I mean, like I said, the example of our government, which has been paralyzed for the last year and a half, because it's equally divided and everybody's entrenched in their camp and nobody will give an inch, but they're not listening. Like we need to just start listening to each other to overcome these divides. Because as we've been saying in the class, for those of you who are here, you know, the common humanity, there's so much more that unites us than what divides us. We're divided at the level of positions. If you imagine an iceberg above the waterline is your position and it seems so divided. But then there's so much more under the surface of human feelings and needs that unites us. So that's what we need to, I mean, it's so urgent, I feel, to access that. And we have, you know, I, I read this quote from uh, Sharon Salzberg, who's a meditation teacher. And she said something once that in a talk that I heard, and she said, Love isn't a feeling, it's an ability. And if it's an ability, it's our responsibility, right? And I think the people in this room, you wouldn't be here right now if you didn't have some feeling for this kind of stuff. So taking responsibility, you know, because it shifts kind of one heart, mind at a time, doesn't it? And opening up, yeah. Hmm. I'd like to add that um, for me, uh, uh, a core message that um, Buddhist realization was around identity. So you know, we can get lost in philosophy sometimes, but he's willing to talk about like, I, I don't know who I am. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and I know a lot of people think they know who they are, but I'm willing to look at that. On a practical level, um, he walked and talked and hung out with literally everybody. He was willing to dialogue and include um, everybody, even like totally annoying people, uh, even um, former um, serial murderers like uh, Angulimala, right? Amazing, you know, yeah. totally, uh, and all kinds of different things, and and I think that's, you know, sometimes we we get lost in in Dharma Club. I just want to be with the people that look like me and use the same language and have the same social skills. <laughs> so I, uh, I'm I'm very much glad that um, Tenzin can come and also give us the mechanics of how to set it up because mm. that. Uh, yeah. Uh, as some of the people here are probably bored of me saying, uh, after Mahamudra comes administration. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to do that. It's something, yeah, and I love, you know, there's so many ways of accessing this mental training you know, for me, I'm such a student of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, who says, you know, there's a very, very formal Buddhist approach that, you know, is being transmitted here in the so-called West. I don't really like that term, but we'll use it for now. You know, non-traditional Buddhist countries and these beautiful temples, and that attracts certain numbers of people and then Lama and I have been talking about this more, you know, secular approach, like how do we, and His Holiness is all about that. And two of the modalities that I teach this compassion cultivation training that was developed at Stanford in the cultivating emotional balance, like how can we 
take these transformative methods and make them accessible to everyone, even the people who aren't going to be interested in Buddhism per se, for any number of reasons. And the whole variety, offering the whole variety, you know, offering these beautiful prayers and these practices like we just did at the beginning of this session. And then also reaching, like when I did the compassion training myself, I did it at Stanford Medical School, you know, with a bunch of people dressed in like business suits, who isn't who I usually hang out with, you know, at all. People in like high heels and like nylons, I'm like people still wear nylons years later like wow right and there they were having this amazing experience with compassion so i love lama's vision of you know the whole breadth of the offerings and including the interactive pieces i mean we had people come to this event last weekend that will then just seek out some transformative methods because they had a lived experience of just the conversation you know, and that was kind of the door in to, you know, being open to really look at their lives and look at some of the strong views that they'd held in a slightly different way. And then maybe they'll also eventually engage in practice or whatever, or even if not, you know, they have that experience. So. Oh, my root teacher, very progressive, um, very tied to the Dalai Lama at the same time and very conservative. So his message to me consistently was um, uh, do really strong yogic practice, really strong meditative practice and do yogas. After that, do what you want. But if you follow just the rites and rituals, you know, and don't do the inner practices that start with calm abiding meditation, by the way, uh, <laughs> Uh, then, then the rest will just be a shell. So um, he had very strong views about uh, why, you know, what the problems were in Tibet because he was intimately involved in Sergei and the problems mm -hmm. there. And he said, you know, the political infighting destroyed it, mm -hmm. not the Chinese as much. The Chinese, obviously, but political mm -hmm. infighting. Um, and then the second thing was. Um, uh, too too big temples are too big. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so actually, um, when when I was studying with him when he was alive, he he didn't want to have um, a temple building at all. He just wanted people to meet in their houses. So <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. I'm kind of like, well, guess what, Geshe? Here we are. <laughs> Hopefully, he's some in uh, Dakini land somewhere watching. <laughs> <laughs> but I've tried to keep it that home quality and for people to be doing strong practice at home and in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, he was kind of like John John Wesley, any Methodists here in the group? Like, you know, like let's not do, you know, build big churches. Let's let's go out and meet the people where they are. Mm -hmm. Um, so I did that model for a long time, but I realized also that people do need a space like this to congregate. Mm -hmm. So I do have a little bit growing up uh, a congregational church idea, meaning there's a meeting house, but the church is the people, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. You know, they're the building, but uh, it's the Sangha that's doing the work. So uh, you know, he, he was very innovative and like, just just get out and do something, right? Mm -hmm. don't, don't just, you know, put up more thingies, you know? I, However, I do like I do like the art and I do like ritual to an extent, but that should be support for doing mm -hmm. uh, what what we'd say from Zogchen perspective is conduct, mm -hmm. right? Let's get out and do something, right? So um, I'm glad that the the workshop is happening, and uh, I hope we can repeat it again because we still need to do the inner work mm -hmm. to be able to help each others without being overwhelmed. That, that's a frequent thing that maybe um, Tenzin could talk about a little bit, which is the views more like a passion burnout. But I'd also like to hear her talk about secondary trauma. Mm. Um, because uh, it's actually unavoidable. I, I get secondary trauma, mm. you know, when, when I'm working with people.
people that have gone through traumatic experience. You can't avoid it. Mm -hmm. You have to work with it and mm -hmm. uh, digest it. And there's no way to say, well, I just met with someone who's just ran over their child with their truck mm -hmm. and not be affected, right? Yeah. You can't go, well, you know, <laughs> that's okay. That's their stuff. No, you, you're going you're gonna to be in their world, right? And it's mm -hmm. going to elicit trauma. And it's how we digest that and work with it ourselves as, mm -hmm. as helpers or counselors or healers. So mm -hmm. I know she has a lot to say about this. And this is not uh, rehearsed. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have to say talk about it at all if you don't want to. Yeah, no, that's such an and I'd love to I'd love to hear what you think about it too. Because I mean, I think sometimes we overestimate our ability to hold like when we want to help others we want to be there for others we want to be an empathic compassionate presence for others which is so beautiful but sometimes we think we need to be so heroic about it that we don't need our own resourcing too and that we can hold it infinitely and that we don't set a boundary and say okay now you know now I've had a lot and I need to go away and process it and take care of myself and resource myself and get my resilience back. And to me, you know, I have one Buddhist teacher who says, you know, famously things like don't waste even one second of your precious human rebirth. And I think it just feeds into our neurosis of like, I can never rest. I can never stop. I have to serve, 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 you know, but we get it in, in a, into doing it in a really unhealthy, unbalanced way, because we're so scared of going to the extreme of self-absorption that we don't just find the middle ground of balance and for me, balance has been so hard in my life. I'm just so extreme. I'm all or nothing. It's just my personality. And I feel like it's like a Zen koan for my whole life of like, how do you find balance? But figuring out what that is for us and not comparing it to someone else, because your capacity may be really different. So if you're comparing yourself to someone else who's worked for a long time to build up more capacity before they need to take a break. And then you're pushing yourself to be like one of your teachers, for example, which I'm a survivor of, you know, <laughs> don't do it. Like, so it takes self-awareness and it takes permission, giving yourself permission. It takes really accepting where we are. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama talks about this so beautifully when he talks about the spiritual path and he says, we have to hold these two things simultaneously. And it's really hard to hold them simultaneously, like deep self-acceptance of where we are without falling into complacency of like, oh, it just is what it is. And I'm just me, you know, you be you, I'll be me. And staying stuck in that. And he goes, we need to have a vision, but not to be striving and pushing towards the vision, you know, instead of like, a machine shop trying to like mangle us into shape. It's like gardening, which is just a process. Like we trust the practice and we trust the process and just watch the growth ha that happens if we put the causes and conditions into place, you know, and trusting that. So I think it's about like self-acceptance and having the vision of our capacity to benefit beings more and then just trusting the practice and the process of transformation. And what I found really helpful is, you know, if I get down on myself for not doing enough, instead of comparing myself to necessarily His Holiness the Dalai Lama, it's really helpful for me to compare myself to myself, like even two years ago, five years ago, and go, oh, no, my capacity really has grown. Like naturally I can hold more, you know, in terms of being there for people, in terms of supporting people, mostly because I've allowed myself to progress slowly and to figure out what resources me and not to feel guilty doing that and not overlooking connection as a resource. You know, sometimes in, especially Americans, with such a highly individualistic culture, 
that we think that resourcing means like going into the room and closing the door. Maybe it means just being with people and talking about what just happened, you know, not breaking confidentiality, but just like, wow, I need to hang out and just laughing and playing and joy and fun can be really resourcing. I was even at a, at a meeting once with, um, a group of chaplains that worked with the Santa Cruz hospice. And so they held quarterly meetings for those of us who are chaplains of the various faith communities and just hospital chaplains. And one meeting was all about like self-care and how do you take care of yourself? And the person facilitating had it, this flip chart and he's writing down what everybody said, you know, kind of harvesting the feedback and people are like getting my nails done, going to the spa, going for a walk. Da -da 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 -da. And by about the third flip chart page, I was like, community, connection, brands, like they're like, oh, right. You know, so sometimes we overlook in the social justice space these days, they talk a lot about community care, like their self-care, but how much community care. And I think places like this are so resourcing, like Lama said, you know, creating community and Sangha. It's the overlooked of the three jewels. You know, I think a lot of times for us converts to Buddhism, we take all kinds of refuge in Buddha Dharma. We're like, oh yeah, Sangha, that's the thing we just say, recite. We're not holding it on equal footing to the Buddha and Dharma. I didn't for a long time. I still am working on it. We're like, oh yeah, Buddha Dharma Sangha. We say it, we pay lip service, but we don't really do it. So I'd love to hear what you have to say about that question of how do we stay present without, you know, that burnout and distress. I like the word you used yesterday, uh, empathetic distress. Empathic, empathic distress. distress. Yeah. 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 So on a very practical level, um, I am. Uh, I always need, after talking with someone particularly very difficult or being with someone, I, I need a quiet time by myself. So that's usually the case in my professional job at Middleway Health. Um, I'm a really, there's a really neat, uh, would call it a formal secular structure of the door with the in session sign on it. So <laughs> um, when the in session sign on, is like you don't mess with it. So someone leaves, and then the sign's still on the door, and I close the door, and then I, you know, mm -hmm. I have to take some breaths. Uh, Thich Nhat Han, um, wonderful teacher, passed away recently. Was really good at that. You know, just saying, you know, return to your breath, and you know, find your um, find your home right there. Mm -hmm. um, also, Robert Aiken, though she got extended with, was wonderful that way. Like just. Take a moment. Don't don't do anything. You know, mm -hmm. digest. Um, I also have a really good uh, business partner, office manager, Judy Taylor, who knows to say, "Don't go in there." When in <laughs> <laughs> session. Uh, so uh, for helpers and healers that um, don't have that kind of formal office, um, my suggestion is to develop some kind of um, you know, sign, <laughs> maybe a neon sign on your forehead. <laughs> I'm still in session with myself mm -hmm. and I won't be ready to see anybody, even a friendly face until I reset. Um, the second part is someone who understands, um, but isn't going to give you advice or even necessarily draw you out. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know Tenzin talked about that yesterday and will today too. Um, you know, for me, that, uh, that important person uh, that most of, some of you know, should Sabrina Schultz, uh, is a longtime psychiatric nurse. So she's very good about not asking, not breaking confidentiality or asking questions, just listening. Um, I'll just share, you know, one traumatic moment <laughs> so uh uh we weren't even uh together then i was monastic but um uh, a prominent psychiatrist that was my patient killed himself right after my return from one of my retreats at sarah j and any other therapists in the room yeah okay hi andrew that's right mm -hmm. um 
he knows my story there. So, you know, horrible. So you're processing this, you know, but the first thing you have to do is like, you're calling your attorney, right? What was the very first thing you think the attorney, this is good, good I like the attorneys of my, what do you think the attorney said? Right, don't talk to anyone. Don't talk to anyone. Oh my gosh. Don't talk to anyone. Yeah. So uh, that was difficult. Um, uh, actually, his uh, his head social worker was also a dear friend of mine. So I think I don't know. I don't know what she knew. I don't know. I don't, can't talk. Um, actually, um, at that point, Sabrina and I had lost touch, but I knew she knew this person. <laughs> so I I said, you know that. Uh, psychiatrist that we used to work with and then she said I heard mm. and that was it right yeah. connection right didn't even have to name the name in fact mm. it, it wasn't until a couple of years ago I could even say the name that's trauma right yeah but at least I had one person that was kind of like okay we're, we're not talking about this but I, I know what was ironic about that incident is that um uh you know, was contracted with Sutter Health at that time to do critical incident, incident stress debriefing. Remember that? I don't know if we're doing it anymore. <laughs> gone, like everything. And they called me oh. and said, uh, you know, we, we had this horrible event. Would you come to talk to the hospital? And it was really weird because I had to say, you know, I just not really, I can't, you know, I not available and we thought that's weird like but i couldn't say anything and so those two things for me have been really important like have have a space to kind of breathe reset and the person doesn't even have to know exactly what's going on but yeah. one person who you can say i just went through something and i need you to know i went through that or i'm going through that and you don't even have to like describe every little detail either. Mm -hmm. It's just, you have that person, and go, okay, got you there, you know, holding it there. So th those two things are, are really, um, those two things are one way to deal with this, uh, you know, secondary trauma. Though at that point it felt, um, it felt like, you know, initial trauma too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but even when it doesn't really directly affect me, then, you know, I still need a okay, quiet time. Mm -hmm. Going back to kindergarten, and yeah. you know, one person that can meet your iodine. Mm -hmm. For a lot of people, being in nature also really helps. And I've kind of combined my quiet time with like a walk. I find also when I walk, I can process things in a different way, you know, than I can also if I'm just sitting. But but it's the allowing, right? Because a lot of us. You know, I found for myself and, and a lot of people I talk to, we set the bar really high because we have this aspiration to be of benefit to all beings. I mean, sometimes we say that prayer and that aspiration all the time, but realizing it's a process of increasing our capacity little by little. And we're still human. We're still human. Don't think, you know, because I I'm a like I said, a survivor just pushing myself too far, too fast. And then beating myself up for not being at my vision. I always joke and I say, when people become Buddhists, they're like, oh, great. I was just getting to the point after years of therapy of accepting myself as a flawed human. And now I need to be enlightened. Thank you very much. Like you just raised the bar really high, but like pump the brakes, take it slowly. <laughs> yeah. Should we see if there's questions? Because we're nearly out of time already. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I th I thought it was till twelve. But we're <laughs> we've got the remote. We've got the remote. Yeah. Should we see if there's comments and and we've got a mic here. If anybody, yeah, there's a hand. Any questions or comments or reflections? 
it's already on, so. Thank you for being here, Visible Tennyson. Thank you. Nice to see you again. Um, so I'm afraid I have kind of a cynical comment question. Um, when we were talking about these conversations mm -hmm. and what a great experience it was. Um, I brought compassion cultivation training to the hospital I work at. Um, three residencies, surgery, internal medicine, family medicine. Um, after the first of about eight sessions that were scheduled, the surgery residents went to the chief and said, this is a waste of our time. We don't want to be doing this. The chief said, okay. Uh, internal medicine, the room was full. By the second time, the chief said, by the way, this is voluntary. Um, the second week, there were three internal medicine residents. They were looking around the room. By the third week, they were gone. Mm -hmm. um, there's Maybe you know the joke, how many therapists does it take to change a light bulb? Only one, but the light bulb has to want to change. So I think the people that show up for these conversations have an openness. Mm. Um, but when we talk about tribalism and, and these polarizations, mm. Mm. Um, there's a lot of people who are convinced that there's nothing they need to look at. Mm. And so how are we reaching those people? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I, It's interesting for me when I look at that, because I, I think about that a lot. Like I've taught in prisons for 15 years, like up until COVID. And I was constantly having to remind myself that my experience with people experiencing incarceration was way slanted towards the guys that voluntarily showed up to be in my class. And this was not the general population at all. And I'd always have to remind myself. And, but, and too, I've seen that even when people self-select because they always already have an interest we're so connected to so many people. And then you talk about your experience to maybe somebody who wasn't initially interested. And then maybe something sparks in them. Like there's this thing of like the ripple effect and planting the seeds. And so it starts that way, but none of us exists in isolation. So I thought of all the hippie people in Santa Cruz that came up for the conversations and loved it. They're all gonna go home. And they're going to talk about it with other people who weren't there, who might become curious. So I really like when we think about, you know, and this is the basic Buddhist principle, right? Interconnection. When you think about all of the people that we're influencing all the time, that we don't even, we're not even aware of the impact. I mean, that happens to me all the time. And it's not only just when I've got the role of teacher, I'll just say something on the fly to someone Five years later, they'll be like, that thing you said, I have no idea what they're even talking about, but it made an impact. And so I think there's some trust in interconnection with this kind of stuff. And we have to start somewhere. And it's really sad to have that experience, you know, and it's discouraging to have that kind of experience. And like, I mean, again, to put on the Buddhist hat, you know, we say that those that karmic energy is never wasted. And we don't have any idea how it's going to bear fruit, but just trusting that just keeping trying to spread the seeds and that just knowing, you know, there's a ripple effect of all of the positivity that we're trying to put out there. And it may take a while, like somebody may hear somebody talking about the compassion training. And then five years later, they're going through a really hard time in their life. And they're like, Oh, that thing that I heard about, you know, years ago, I think one of the things and we're talking about burnout, I think one of the things that can set us up if we have a really specific expectation in the short term, you know, and so taking the long view of just, you just keep showing up, you just keep showing up, the word keeps spreading, eventually you'll have 10 people, then 12, and then the classes will be full you know, but it takes, yeah, just taking the long view and like really trusting the process and knowing that we're all interconnected and, and, and it does make a difference. 
Yeah, not so satisfying. And I know those kind of things can be really discouraging. Yeah, thank you. So, Rami, do you have a... I can't... Hospital systems are the most difficult system uh, that I've encountered, much more difficult than political systems, because political, I mean, you still pretty much do have free elections, even though somebody tried to overturn them recently, because <laughs> um, uh, the healthcare is a steady state system that's very resistant. So, um, uh, I'm not offering a solution here because um, um, maybe just maybe just a support and understanding. I spent a lot of time talking with Sabine about Kaiser <laughs> and having worked in two hospital systems. Um, I, I, I myself, I become um, somewhat oppositional and defiant, like. I'm going to say this, even though you bastards aren't going to do it. So I do have that side. I know you have that side too. You have that, you know, kind of, um, well, F it, I'm going to just do it. And I, I think there's some, this, there can be power in that too. Sometimes we have to plant flowers by the wall, but, but sometimes we have to, you know, have, have a pickaxe, even though we're just chipping away or sandpapering on it. So, you know, with, at Sutter, I started up a meditation group, and then the administrators came out and praised it, and then effectively killed it later. So my my personal tongue lend to soften my heart is is not with Putin or Donald Trump or people. It, it's with hospital administrators. <laughs> No. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Yeah. I, I think this might be similar actually, but I'm not sure. But in, in my work in school, we have a, a school counselor, school therapist, and they give trainings about how to work with kids that are quite difficult because in my school, uh, I have some a few classes, they're called SES or what used to be known like emotionally disturbed. And the counselor was giving different approaches for those kind of very difficult children, because they are. And um, some of the staff, uh, it was kind of like they just all ganged up on her. She had all these kind of new ways to help um, open these children up in, in ways that aren't usual. They're kind of like, um, uh, like with lots of love, actually, instead of um, what the usual way is like suspension, that's how uh, difficult their infractions are. And so instead, have, she made a special room for them. It's all peaceful with beanbag chairs. I mean, I feel like I want to be diagnosed <laughs> because it's so beautiful what she does with the music and the special room. And so like they kind of had this attitude of ganging up on her at this meeting. And, um, but I used her things throughout the year and I told her so, just me. I mean, probably there's others too, but it's kind of uh, like it was going against the grain of the group. They all just kind of bonded with each other by saying that won't work, you know. And um, but for myself, I was very impacted by what she said. She's so much. She was so young, and I noticed young people sometimes have the best ideas and the most um, hope for the future. And uh, so I made in my room. I I asked her for music that she liked that she said would help, and I put it in there. I put a beanbag chair, you know, there's no easy one answer, but she certainly helped me. I'm just one person and I have to work with those kids. And I was like grasping for straws. I just mentioned that because she, uh, I told her, but she might, when you're faced with five people that are hard on you and one like me, that I'm an assistant, not a high level person, but I impact other, a lot of kids and she helped me and she maybe, I don't, I need to tell her 
when I go back in the fall, I'll tell her, hey, <laughs> you made my life so much easier because she did. Just want to mention sometimes these uh, results are hidden, I think. So that's I just want to. First of all, I hope this is useful. I'm like to be practical. Um, Andrew's comment makes me think about a little, uh, uh, this slight difference or maybe a big difference when, when I'm talking to someone kind of individually, I feel it's fairly, it's easier to make a connection even when they're like coming from a totally different place. I find it really difficult to talk institutionally um and and that's something i'd like to work with too is like how you know we can like when i'm when i say hospital administrators i mean uh institution how, how do you talk to an institution so i'm i'm a one-on-one -on -one person so like like etc i would this was etc cetera, et cetera, psychiatry i would just like go to diane stewart and say like let's talk about this or you know, Dan, we just sat last night next to each other to watch Cirque du Soleil, and now you're canceling the program. <laughs> Wait a minute, she goes, well, that was, we were just friends watching, you know, and we went out and, you know, now I'm the administrator. I go, well, what happened there, you know? Well, now I represent Sutter, you know? So I need tools to do that. You know, I, I have um, opted out of, uh, an institutional hospital mental health setting. And I worked for Sacramento County three different times. I thought, I struck out three times. I hated it three times, that's it. So I'm not, you know, and, and Sutter and Heritage Oaks and other places, I, mean, I can't do it. So I'm very humbled by my interaction with institutional injustice and institutional craziness because it is a different psychology. It feels like when, when you talk to someone individually, it, it always seems like, well, maybe I just like people agreeing with me, but they go, oh, Stephen, thank you for bringing that to my attention. <laughs> that the values here are totally in accord with what you're suggesting. And then you know, a day later, I'm sorry, we don't seem to have the resources or the money for that program. Where, where did that go? You know. Um, I think Andrew has a, you know, we're starting a dialogue. Just one more, one more comment uh, for what it's worth. There's a, a book called Compassionomics. Have you guys heard of this? Um, so some physicians in New Jersey uh, did some research on how does compassion uh, make money? which is the language of administrators show me the money so it's 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 a good nice way to kind of speak their language in a way that they might actually hear so for what it's worth compassionomics I wanted to also mention, because this comes up a lot in the compassion training, and, you know, we we do this sort of progression in the compassion training where we build our capacity, you know, with more and more peripheral people in our lives. Like we say with compassion, we all we all naturally have compassion for the loved one. So we start with that. The self is a whole different story, whether we naturally have self-kindness and self-compassion or not. Where is that? You know, kind of in the concentric circles of difficulty is, you know, depends on the individual. And then we talk about the neutral person. And then we start working with the difficult person. And so the question always comes up, 
how do I have compassion for someone who actually causes harm? Like somebody who does really harmful things to others. Because often we think we get a pass, like I don't have to have compassion. Or we think <clears throat> being compassionate means you're going to be taken advantage of by that person, or you're not doing anything to stop the harm or prevent the harm. And for me, you know, it's been so helpful to encourage people to separate the person from the action. You know, you can have all kinds of very strong feelings of aversion towards the action the person is doing, but still trying to see the humanity in the person. Because the minute we start saying, oh, I'll have compassion for these amount of people, but this one doesn't deserve it. This one, and we dehumanize using all kinds of language, like, oh, they're just a monster or they're, uh, you know, and we label. And it's really, really hard. And for me, I feel like this is kind of my lifelong quest is to really get the separation between the person and the action, holding compassion towards the person, even if you manifest stopping the harm in a really wrathful, heavy way. And this is totally allowed in Buddhism. We have like different ways of manifesting and one is called wrathfulness. So you can stop it. Being compassionate towards the person doesn't mean you're a doormat. And this is so important to understand because I've had a lot of people resist even coming to the compassion training because they're afraid I'm going to train them to be a doormat and just roll over. Compassion doesn't mean doing everything that everybody wants you to do at all times. You set appropriate boundaries. Sometimes the most compassionate thing, if anybody's ever had a Tibetan Lama for a teacher, you know this from direct experiences, them snatching you up and just going, what are you doing? You know, in a really heavy way, sometimes the most compassionate thing is a very firm strong boundaries. So I wanted to mention that. And I was talking to somebody recently about, so how do we have compassion towards someone who's even creating harm? And for me, you know, many religious traditions have a dichotomy of good and evil. So they'll actually say things like that, the, the person is evil. But in Buddhism, we have the dichotomy is ignorance and wisdom right? And so we say, if someone is acting in a way that harms others, they're also harming themselves, because they don't have an understanding of the true causes of happiness and suffering, right? And so by understanding, oh, they don't know, you know, they're engaging in this action that is causing harm to them and others. And then that, for me, can really be the access point for compassion, I mean, not to condone the behavior at all, but like, wow, this person has no idea. And we we're talking about trauma. I mean, I hope I don't offend anybody. I'm obviously, I've already outed myself as very far left on the political spectrum. So if you don't share my views, I don't mean to offend anybody, but I'm just talking about my own experience with the former president. And it was easy for me to have the experience of him as like a trauma survivor acting out of like serious trauma. So it helped me. I hated every decision he made. He made some decision about the prison system. I'm like, oh my God, I actually agree with that. It was like something about mass incarceration. I was like, that's weird. I agree. Mostly not at all. But if I could see, wow, this is a person, everything, you know, he's doing because I'd seen that with a lot of my students in prison, you know, doing incredibly dysfunctional and destructive things, but just like all the rest of us trying to find happiness and avoid suffering, but doing it in severely dysfunctional ways, just out of ignorance. And that's what helps me, right? And differentiating the person from the action and realizing you can still take very forceful action to prevent harm, even, but motivated by compassion for everybody in the situation and not motivated by hatred and anger. And some people really resist doing compassion training because they're afraid they'll lose their fire of, you know, activism against social injustice. But it's so much more sustainable if what's fueling it is compassion rather than anger. If we're fueled by anger, we'll burn out. If we're fueled by compassion, it's infinite. It's not a zero sum situation, right? So I just really wanted to mention that and I'd love to hear, pass the mic. Oh. Yeah. 
<laughs> figured it out. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, you know, in my professional therapy practice, worked with some really unsavory people. Uh, uh, but but I've hung in there, partially because I know that um, uh, people and believe it to be um, a truth about uh, reality is that things change. So when we say people don't change, we're actually delusional because people have to change because that's impermanence, right? They have to, so they're gonna. Um, also, when I'm meeting with someone, I, I don't really know what their future is going to be. So, in a, in a, in a really important mantra is, I'm not omniscient. I'm not omniscient. <laughs> I don't know, you know. Um, we probably wouldn't have Buddha Dharma if it wasn't, uh, or we probably wouldn't if it wasn't for Emperor Ashoka. Emperor Ashoka in India was the Hitler Putin of his time. Um, and somehow, and I don't know the history individually, but somehow he, he had a turning around uh, and um, felt remorse and use old time religious term, repented and, and uh, decided to do uh, something good. Um, from a cynical side is maybe we could say, well, he just had enough <laughs> and wanted to redeem his, uh, you know, his legacy. But um, uh, it is possible for people to make huge changes like on Gilimala, for example. And um, I have seen that. And by being around long enough, um, one of the people that I met with at the prison that invited me in to become the first Buddhist chaplain in California, Paul Dewey, um, was in for like 25 years for vehicular manslaughter. Um, and then mentioned it to a few people. Maybe it was, <laughs> I'm losing track. Maybe it was 15 years ago, whenever uh, the Dalai Lama gave um, uh, Yamataka and Paramount in Long Beach waiting in line and this guy comes running up to me and go, Lama Jampa, Lama Jampa. <laughs> and it, it was Paul, he had been finally released and it was working in a rehab facility. How cold does that get, right? But, um, you know, so actually people do change um, and sometimes they change for the worse <laughs> before they get better, right? So we don't, we don't know. Right now, I, I'd be willing to teach meditation to Hitler because I think uh, the seeds we, you know, plant um, uh, do come to fruition. So my other reality thing, and I know it's conventional reality, we're not talking emptiness, but strong conventional reality, strong relative reality is this absolutely impossible that a good cause has a bad effect. That you really have to get that. That's so key, and I know so many of, our teachers and uh, thinking of venerable tense in here, like they just hammer away and you go, okay, enough already, <laughs> stop it. You know, I'm done with bodhicitta, I'm done with karma, you know, but <laughs> blood's running out of your ears. Lama Zopa is talking about bodhicitta. Uh, but, you know, it really, it's important to get that. You know, it's impossible that a good cause will have a bad effect. And it's it's impossible for a cause not to have an effect. That's the other thing. Otherwise, we're actually nihilists. So let's not be Dharma nihilists, right? We can be secular Dharma people. We can we can be Stephen Bachelor Buddhists. <laughs> have you read that book? You know, yeah, you know, we can be Stephen Bachelor book, you know, Buddhists argue with Bob Thurman like this, no, this is rebirth, it's bullshit. And, Bob's defending it, and you know, I like those guys. Anyway, so, but <laughs> yeah. So, but there's really something that a good cause is going to have a good effect, and a 
cause is always going to produce an effect. And then, you know, in impermanence, Buddha's last words, all conditioned phenomena are permanent. Well, last words, right effort, do something. Do something, not just right effort. That's a philosophical term. No, it freaking means do something, right? You know, keep going. So uh, that's, you know, uh, that's hard when we're dealing with institutional racism and institutional craziness and, you know, profoundly sociopathic people, right? You know, like you're looking at people that I've looked through and it's like, there's nothing there, you know, that kind of look. But, um, uh, it, you know, et cetera, we'd say, well, we're just going to keep throwing the jello against the wall. <laughs> there are these little hospital things that are not very kind. So <laughs> that's called hospital humor. I think Andrew knows that one too. And, you know, I mean, I love what Lama Jumbo is just saying about, you know, how no effects are wasted and also realizing everything that happens is a result of such a complex web of so many causes and conditions coming together, right? So it's like, if we get attached to, I'm going to be the savior and I'm going to make the difference single-handedly, nothing happens like that. And you can be one of the threads that goes into the tumbleweed of causes and conditions that creates some change. And it may be way down the line. It may not be, you know, any time in the short term. But yeah, trusting that it's not wasted. I'm old enough to remember things in my life that seem completely permanent and monolithic. Like as a child, there would be these air raid sirens and I would hide under my desk in kindergarten with my little four-year-old arms over my head because it was the middle of the Cold War and like, that's really going to help you when Russia, you know, in the Soviet Union on the map. And then it just sort of dissolved kind of from within. Like suddenly, and you were like, wait, what? You know, apartheid in South Africa, I spent the entire decade of the 80s marching against, you know, and boycotting all the businesses. And then suddenly Nelson Mandela's president, you know, gets released in his president. You know, so it's like significant things. I mean, Mahatma Gandhi, a dude in a loincloth against the British Empire, and they left willingly and had parades and were like, bye. Okay, y'all, you're on your own again now. You know, so these huge things that seem so permanent and monolithic and unchangeable. So even remembering that, and then you go, okay, Mahatma Gandhi worked for decades and didn't give up and just tirelessly and planted the seeds and did the thing. And all of these situations took decades to manifest, but they all came from all those little causes and conditions coming together. So trusting that we're part of that, that we have agency. I mean, own your agency to change the world, like own it because it's there because that's the only way it's going to happen. And don't think that your actions are negligible because nothing ever is, right? So yeah, take take agency and, and just keep doing the right thing out of that sense of integrity because it's the right thing to do without attachment to an outcome that you can perceive in the short term. Just do it because it's the right thing to do. I'll get off my I'm ready. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah, let's Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. May that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. 
all-powerful Chenrez and Tenzin Gyatso. Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Lo Song Dragpa, I make the request at your holy feet. <laughs>